Good. Welcome, everybody. I'm uh, Professor Shahra Makhbarzadeh, convener of uh, Middle East Studies Forum at Deakin University. Uh, this is our second uh, policy dialogue that we are running. For this uh, session, we are looking at the conflict in Afghanistan and prospects of peace. As uh, you will have followed the news, there have been intra-Afghan negotiations going on in Doha, and um, finally, there might be prospects of uh, an end to the conflict, but it does present challenges. As we discussed in the first policy dialogue, there are challenges uh, of bringing the Taliban into the government, for so, uh, civil society organizations, for women's rights, for minorities. Uh, and it's important for us to be aware and consider ways of addressing those challenges. So we are very fortunate uh, to have a, an expert panel to explore these issues. And of also the question of um, foreign power interference and involvement in Afghanistan. It's no secret that uh, Afghanistan has been the subject of um, foreign influence, foreign interference, and that has really complicated the internal dynamics of conflict in Afghanistan. And it's also made finding a solution a lot more complicated and difficult. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our four speakers who will each speak for about 10 to 15 minutes and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A and discussion. Um, the order of our speakers is that uh, we have first uh, Mr. Rahmanullah Nabil, uh, who is a prominent Afghan politician. He served as the head of um, National Director of Security during 2010-2012. After that, he held a position as an acting director in 2013 and later was reappointed as a director of NDS in 2014. Uh, in 2015, he resigned from NDS. He continues to be a significant uh, political player in Afghanistan. Then we'll uh, move on to uh, Mr. Shoaib uh, Rahim, who is senior advisor to the Minister of Peace in Afghanistan. Previously, he was the acting mayor of Kabul, and he's also worked in Afghanistan's Ministry of Defense. Then we move on to Mr. Shakti Sinha, who is the Honorary Director of Atal Bihari Vajpai Institute of Policy Research and International Studies at MS University in India. Um, he is a distinguished fellow at India Foundation. And he's also, he also serves as the Joint Secretary. He has also served, I beg your pardon, as a joint secretary in the minister, in prime minister's office. And we've, uh, our final speaker would be uh, Ambassador Rakesh Sood, who is a distinguished fellow at uh, Observer Research Foundation in India. He has over 38 years of experience in the field of foreign affairs, economic diplomacy, international security, he joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1976 and served in the Indian mission in Brussels, Dakar, Geneva, and Islamabad. He uh, was also in charge of multilateral disarmament negotiations, bilateral dialogues with India, strategic dialogue with other countries, including the United States, UK, France, and Israel. He served as ambassador to Afghanistan Nepal and France, um, and was appointed Prime Minister's Special Envoy for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Mr. Rahmatullah Nabil to commence the session. Thanks a lot. Uh, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to be part of uh, this discussion. I will sort it uh, you know, I call it uh, the proxy piece so far, because uh, Afghans were not involved uh, since two years when uh, the first discussion was started between uh, United States, Pakistan, and Taliban. And we raise our concern of uh, proxy peace, because uh, proxy peace uh, will end up 
with the proxy war because of uh, the situation in Afghanistan since 40 years. As you also mentioned that uh, the involvement of uh, several players in several countries in Afghanistan. But uh, before going, uh, to talk about why the proxy peace will uh, not help, just uh, maybe some of your audience uh, are familiar with the uh, situation in Afghanistan in these 40 years, but I will go briefly through that, <clears throat> which will help us uh, to, to compare the current situation with the, the previous one. As uh, you know that uh, in uh, 1979, for the first time when the Khalq Democratic Party took power after the coup, and then uh, after the Russian invasion or uh, Soviet uh, Union invasion in Afghanistan, uh, the resistance was sorted. And Pakistan used uh, this resistance uh, as an opportunity. And then at that time, General Ziaul Haq, uh, with the help of uh, their uh, DG ISI, Abu, uh, Akhtar Abdurrahman, and also later on Hamid Gul, uh, put a policy of uh, interference in Afghanistan uh, and call it a strategic depth um, for, for Pakistan in Afghanistan. Uh, with uh, mainly, they have started with five uh, important, uh, you know, step, which uh, they put it at that time together. Number one, uh, they have created several desks in their, uh, you know, ISI uh, for, for how to, uh, you know, so call it uh, jihad of that time, uh, use that banner um, and, and uh, actually to defeat um, Soviet Union of that time because of this uh, Cold War and also uh, having two blocks, uh, NATO, United States and also uh, USSR or Soviet Union of, of um, Warsaw Pact. At that stage, Hello? Please continue. Can hear you. We can hear you. Uh, at that stage, uh, they, they prepared a five uh, uh, link policy. Uh, the first one was uh, to, uh, in order to create further motivation of war in Afghanistan. Because of that, several uh, madrasas uh, were put it together under the name of, uh, you know, jihad promotion number, uh, and also the uh, financial uh, support for this uh, war in Afghanistan was uh, put it together a policy for that uh, with the help of United States and, and Saudi Arabia and some other country. Uh, the safe haven and also training center, thousands, uh, hundreds of uh, uh, camps were put it together for training. Uh, the Fighters were recruited even from outside the region from uh, different um, countries. And also the other uh, important uh, portion of this war was uh, uh, the uh, putting uh, thousands of uh, madrasa uh, to uh, promote the political Islam or extremism uh, in different parts of Pakistan. And more than that, uh, the, the motivation which was created under the banner of jihad, uh, and since that time, uh, the Pakistan was directly involved, uh, got involved in Afghanistan uh, with the help of some other country. And, uh, and then when after the Russian withdrawal, uh, instead of uh, changing policy uh, of Pakistan, uh, they start supporting uh, some specific Mujahideen groups in order to, uh, and then promote it to a, even um, to a, an ethnic war. And at that stage, uh, some other country in the region also got involved, for example, Iran, uh, and then um, some extent Russians and uh, some other country. And, and uh, th this was the time that uh, when a big terrorist network like uh, Al-Qaeda was created and under the banner of Al-Qaeda, uh, IMU, um, Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan, or ETIM, uh, or 
Jundullah, Jundul Khalifa, and so many other uh, tourist network were uh, started their activity uh, under this uh, uh, hybrid. Gradually, uh, when uh, it turned to become a real, uh, you know, proxy war in Afghanistan, and that uh, was the, the, the time when uh, the internal con conflict was started and Kabul was uh, destroyed. The institutions of Afghanistan was destroyed by, by different names. And, and uh, that paved ground for another uh, groups to pop up, which was uh, Taliban. And uh, with the direct support of Pakistan and uh, instead of uh, you know, leaving Afghanistan with its own, uh, they created Taliban with the help of uh, some other country like United States and, and British. And, uh, uh, at that stage, it was, uh, you know, because uh, people were Afghanistan, people of Afghanistan were fed up with this internal conflict between Mujahideen. And um, they somehow welcomed Taliban in certain area of Afghanistan. But later on, when they saw that uh, Taliban are imposing or monopolizing power to, uh, under the banner of religions, uh, then uh, resistance was started. And that was another uh, uh, stage uh, when uh, several countries got involved because of, uh, you know, um, uh, monopolizing power under the banner of uh, uh, religious and Hanafi, uh, uh, you know, uh, religion by Taliban in Pakistan. That creates uh, another mess in Afghanistan. And uh, finally, we saw that 9-11 uh, happened. This was a time that uh, cooperation was uh, started in Afghanistan because it's very important that to, to uh, have uh, cooperation instead of uh, confrontation in Afghanistan. But gradually, when uh, the US uh, got in, uh, engaged in Iraq once again, and attention went back to Iraq instead of uh, putting uh, more efforts on uh, uh, you know, good governance and institution building, Pakistan used this, uh, this opportunity once again and uh, continued the policy of General Ziaul Haq in uh, after Abdurrahman and put it uh, the same five uh, elements for, for uh, uh, you know, running this war in order uh, to, to impose their uh, puppet government in Afghanistan for a different reason. I will come back, uh, later on uh, to that. And they use the same uh, policy, uh, save heaven, financing, uh, motivation of war, uh, and also creating, uh, you know, disk for, for within ISI for running this uh, war. And then since that time, we see that uh, Pakistan is directly supporting Taliban and uh, Haqqani network. In addition to that, they have already uh, you know, pushed uh, some of their own uh, other uh, terrorist network like uh, lashkar e taiba lashkar e Jangawi, and uh, Mujahideen al-Badr, and some others. And till now, we are facing all these challenges. Uh, while some uh, people or, or some leaders of, of Pakistan or call it uh, the proxy war between uh, Pakistan and India and Afghanistan, I'm totally uh, disagree with that one. Uh, they are trying to reduce uh, the, uh, you know, this war to the a, a proxy war while uh, our security forces are uh, defeating the, 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 their uh, sovereignty, their uh, constitution, uh, and also uh, Afghans are always uh, victims of, of this war. Not, uh, you know, but uh, Pakistan is trying, particularly, I think uh, it was started first by Parviz Musharraf during an interview with the uh, Guardian that he called it a proxy war. He said that we trained Taliban we mobilized Taliban in order to uh, use them as a, uh, you know, their proxy element against India. This is totally, um, we, we are uh, totally disagree with that one because uh, sometimes Pakistan is blaming uh, Afghanistan and in India for this war 
in, uh, in order just to justify their interference in Afghanistan, while it's totally different. Considering all these uh, game which has been played uh, in, in Afghanistan, uh, once again, uh, when we are talking about peace process, uh, there is, uh, there is uh, only one point which uh, make us a little bit optimistic at this stage is that all key players in Afghanistan are uh, keen to see uh, peace in Afghanistan. But the challenge are that what are the definition of uh, peace for all the, the players who, who are involved in Afghanistan? For example, for the United States, we raise our concern that, okay, if U U.S. has their own uh, political uh, situation, then uh, we should be not sacrificed because uh, we, we Afghans paid uh, a heavy cost uh, in these 40 years of, because of this war. Afghans should be involved because uh, if we left it behind, we have seen the bone process was, the failure of bone process was that uh, Hizb Islami of Hikmatyar and also Taliban were left it behind and that uh, created a problem for, for, for Afghanistan. And also the definition of peace for the region uh, we, we don't see a harmonized definition of peace in Afghanistan uh, from, from different countries in the region. Iran have their own concern. Uh, for example, uh, their definition of peace is that the uh, Taliban, with the help of the United States, will take over uh, with the support of Pakistan and a, 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 a pro-Pakistani government will be imposed in Afghanistan. In this case, a portion of Taliban, and then ISK is also the, the uh, Daesh Khorasan branch, which are uh, active in Afghanistan. That make them worry. And then uh, they are, uh, we see the sign of preparing for uh, a proxy uh, from their side, like Fatimun, who fought in, in, in Syria and Iraq against uh, Daesh. Uh, that is uh, you know, a worrying point. And we also saw in Doha uh, during the opening ceremony, <laughs> Iran was not uh, participating. While Iran is our neighbors, and they were involved in Afghanistan in, in the past 40 years uh, in, in a different shape, in different step. And also Central Asia are also worried that uh, the, because of uh, the increased number of foreign fighters, particularly after the uh, Zarba Azba operation by Pakistan in uh, North Waziristan, most of the path uh, or, or uh, the, the border were uh, op kept open uh, to push these uh, foreign fighters uh, from Pakistan to Afghanistan. Uh, for example, Chitral, there is a place, we call it uh, Shah Salim uh, Pass. It was open uh, through Chitral. Uh, thousands of foreign fighters came to the north of Afghanistan uh, and, uh, from uh, different, uh, uh, you know, belonging to different uh, country in the region. That also uh, make the Central Asia, particularly the Russian Federation, worry that what's going on in, up in the north. Because of that, they are uh, they have different definition of peace in Afghanistan. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Course, Nabil. I'm sorry to cut you off, Mr. Nabil, but uh, you've raised so many important issues for us to discuss. So I also want to make sure that we have enough time for the other speakers. Uh, sure. Among those very important issues, Mr. Nabil, is uh, the point you were raising about the power vacuum in the absence of U.S. presence when the U.S. directed attention to Iraq and the vacuum it created for uh, other countries you named Pakistan. So I think that's an important point to explore perhaps with uh, our other speakers and during the Q&A, because now we are facing a very similar situation where the US is looking for an exit from mm -hmm. Afghanistan and what opportunities or what vacuum does that create? So if you don't mind, I'm going to move on to our next speaker. Uh, Shah Ibrahim, if you don't mind. Unmute yourself. Great. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Shahram. Uh, I'd like to um, thank Middle East Studies Forum again for uh, this great setup and panel. And I'm honored to be a part of uh, this panel with uh, distinguished speakers. Um, I would also like to take a slight um, historic lens to this discussion because whether we like it or not, 
we are we are tied to our recent this process is very much tied and dependent on the recent history um, 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 of Afghanistan and the region so to to build on some of the some of the issues that were mentioned by my uh, previous speaker what I'd like to do is I'd like to um, um, divide divide uh, the proxy dynamics into three general phases um, roughly along the same lines um, uh, as uh, um, Mr. Nabil categorized. Um, I, I won't be looking too much into the internal dynamics as this is uh, this panel and the focus of this conversation is uh, regional and international dynamics and how it plays out within Afghanistan. Um, so Afghanistan, just setting it up, I think the Afghan conflict is a very internationalized conflict. Um, uh, which in my opinion means that the level of foreign involvement um, has much greater weight um, um, and plays a much heavier uh, role in the conflict as, as compared to um, uh, internal factors and other factors. It has, has far more weight than, uh, than it should have if there is such a standard. Um, so dividing it into three phases. First is the Soviet invasion up until the Geneva Accords and, uh, and the Soviet withdrawal, that's one phase. Second is post-Soviet withdrawal from, from 89 up until the Bonn Agreement, that would be the second phase. Um, and third would be uh, post-Bonn, so 2001 um, uh, till today. So let's, let's have a very brief, quick look um, at these three phases. So um, after, the, uh, after the Soviet invasion, essentially Cold War dynamics took hold. And, um, and uh, the regional, the regional uh, positioning uh, of actors and the neighboring states and the regional states more or less were drawn along the lines of Cold War dynamics, where on one side you had, uh, you had Pakistan, you had Arab states, and you had the Islamic world. Um, on one side, uh, more in line with, with the West and, and the United States, uh, and on the other side, you had um, the Warsaw Pact, uh, India, and so to, uh, to a uh, slightly lesser extent, China, uh, slightly more aligned with, um, with um, the Soviet side. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the proxy dynamic, the regional uh, positioning of these, of these actors uh, fueled the conflict, was a destabilized factor and and continue to continue to um, uh, continue to create a climate where uh, resolving the conflict seemed less and less possible uh, uh, moving forward up until the decision um, by Moscow to withdraw so once the setup once the discussion of, of Soviet withdrawal um, uh, to gain momentum, there was a window of opportunity. There was a window of opportunity to, for the region to redefine their relationship with the actors with inside Afghanistan, uh, with the state, and, and to redefine the interests. Unfortunately, that window was, was clearly missed. I mean, not just in retrospect, but the, the, the war continued and the conflict continued. And so that was an opportunity lost. Then we reached the issue. Then we reached post withdrawal. Once in '89, the Soviet uh, uh, military withdrew from Afghanistan. That that phase is broken down into three sub phases. We have Dr. Najib's government from 1989 till 1992. Then we have the Mujahideen government uh, led by uh, Professor Abani as president from 1992 onwards. Then we have the Taliban. Um, uh, and their capture of Kabul from 1996 up until 2001. So unfortunately, once we remove the Cold War dynamics, U.S. Soviet, US -Soviet um, uh, tensions inside Afghanistan, uh, it left an open field for regional, com uh, regional competitors and interests. And we saw, we saw a change of um, uh, regional dynamics inside Afghanistan. And essentially what, what the way that unfolded was that increasing, um, increasing Pakistani influence triggered a stronger Indian response. Gulf states and Saudi uh, continued their support 
from, uh, from the 80s, would that triggered a stronger Iranian response? And essentially, uh, uh, the proxy dynamics morphed and uh, changed slightly uh, to reach a new so-called uh, equilibrium. But again, it, uh, it led to greater, greater instability. Once the, when the Taliban captured Kabul, um, only three, rest, three states recognized them. So this, is, this, I think, is a very important indicator to show how divided the region was. So only three states recognized uh, the, the emirate of the Taliban. You had Pakistan, you had United Arab, United Arab Emirates, and you had Saudi Arabia. And all the other regional and international actors continue to recognize uh, the Mujahideen government uh, led by uh, Professor Rabban. And so that continued up until um, uh, the Bonn Agreement in 2001. Now, um, in that situation, um, the biggest driving force or the biggest element which shaped the, the uh, proxy dynamics, if you may, or, or each country's decision or position towards Afghanistan and towards the conflict in Afghanistan was the heavy military presence of the United States and NATO uh, in Afghanistan. So, of course, I'm just simplifying it. Um, there, was, there was great and there is still great discomfort with a heavy military presence by NATO in, in backyard of you know, regional actors such as Russia, Iran, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And the conflict, unfortunately, continued post 2001. And here we are, um, here we are today trying to, um, trying, to, um, uh, trying to end the conflict through the peace process. So um, a, few, a few lessons learned, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll wrap up. A few lessons learned from these three phases and from these three periods um, of, of our conflict. Um, essentially, I think that um, we have to recognize and we have to accept that unless the proxy elements uh, of this conflict are also not negotiated and resolved parallel to the negotiation happening between the two, uh, two direct sides of the conflict, I think any political settlement reached will, will remain uh, vulnerable and remain susceptible to outside intervention. And I think, and, and I don't think that's a scenario that anybody wants. The Afghan public fear um, uh, this vulnerability and understand and recognize the strength and the level of influence that regional, regional actors um, have on any potential political settlement. Um, so I would like to um, uh, mention four points and I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. So the first lesson I think is very important and I'll repeat, we must renegotiate regional relations and try to redefine how the region wants to connect to a post-settlement state in Afghanistan, however that might look. Um, the Afghan government is actively trying to pursue um, uh, this issue um, because we recognize that that is an important element of it. Second, I think we have to be uh, cognizant and aware of the risk of a security vacuum post-US NATO withdrawal um, and, and a possible power vacuum inside, which uh, is the formula for, for disaster based on our experience. Third, I think it's key to highlight the issue of preserving state institutions um, and, and maintaining state capacity and the security apparatus, which, which um, has been one of the silver linings um, um, and one of, the most, one of the most prominent stabilizing factors of the Afghan state. So that needs to be preserved. And finally, I think we need to ensure maximum inclusivity in the process of uh, the political actors as well as social actors. And, and, and these are the lessons learned from the three phases of the conflict and, and, and which the state and everyone's trying to make sure that uh, these elements are addressed as much as possible. So I'll, I will just stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Raib. You've raised um very important points, uh, lessons learned, as you call them. Um, and that really goes to the heart of our discussion. So I'd like to move on very quickly. I don't want to waste time um, waffling here. Move on quickly to our next speaker, Mr. Shakti Sinha. Thank you, Professor Guzadeh. Thank you, Middle East Studies Forum, the Alfred Deakin Institute, and Deakin University. I think you've raised uh, in your concert that is circulated and you mentioned 
the role of the international community is very important. It's important for various reasons. It's important in conflict. It's important in peace. If you look at the history of the last 100 plus years, since 1870, the location of Afghanistan is key to all this involvement of the international community, particularly the neighbors, but sometimes the not so neighbors, a little far away. This, of course, the location of Afghanistan is an advantage. It was once the hub, focusing on trade between the subcontinent and Russia and Europe. And it gained a lot by being its location advantage. But at times like this, it's also its disadvantage, which is why we're discussing it. And the chair, you were right in the beginning when you talked about foreign influence and more important, foreign interference. And part of it, of course, arises from the fact that the borders were drawn hastily and that the split community causes problems for everybody, though to no fault of theirs. But that is there's a bad circumstances which has pushed them into this position. Now, unfortunately, right now, it's a changing world order. It's confused world order. We really don't know. Has the Cold War II started? Not started. Is it likely to start? What is it going to roll out with? Does the November elections have any impact? There's so many clouding factors that is very difficult to really be precise. And unfortunately, in this flux, Afghanistan has fallen off the radar. In the United States, it's not on anybody's pages. Whether Trump remains or goes, Biden comes or goes, for the USA is concerned, they're out of Afghanistan, they won't out. In fact, Biden as vice president had argued years ago that we should be doing only counter-terrorism in Afghanistan. In other words, focus on the Al-Qaeda, forget counter-insurgency, leave it to the Afghans to handle it. So this is something we have to keep in mind that the entitled community is very fickle. It moves, interests are there, but interests also change. And that unfortunately puts Afghanistan in a difficulty. In this scenario that we happen, the neighbors of Afghanistan, international, I'll come to the large international community later, but the neighbors have a very critical role to play. Main, of course, is Pakistan. Let us be very clear, Pakistan has a very large, oversized role to play in Afghanistan. For good or bad, I'll leave it to you to decide. Iran, absolutely. Iran increasingly has become involved in some way or the other. Russia, which is not really a neighbor, but sees itself as a neighbor because of the soft underbelly of the stance. And again, China, which is technically a neighbor because of the Wakhan Corridor. Each of them have very important and different roles to play, which we have to understand. For Pakistan, the fear, the old fear, which led them to a different of the merge, the end of the Treaty of 1893, and the fact that there were movements, in other words, which saw the border. And even today, Afghanistan, including the Taliban, Afghanistan, does not recognize the Durand as a border. So that was a factor. But then Pakistan went beyond its defensive interest in Afghanistan to making an offensive interest in trying to keep an Afghan state under its control. If you can't control it, create enough instability so that they're able to manipulate what is in their interest. And that has worked to Afghanistan's disadvantage. Can that be reversed? Iran, because of the fear of the rise of ISIS and the American factor, and the Russians, for largely the same reasons, have more or less formed an agreement or have been factually dealing, accepting the rise of the Taliban and being able to deal with the Taliban in a different way than what we saw in the earlier avatar that was referred to. The time of the Taliban, Iran and Russia were on the opposite side of the Taliban. Now they see a tactical arrangement with them. Which is very understandable. It may not be very good for Afghanistan in the short term, but it's understandable. And I think that the role of China is very, very critical. China, of course, is seen as a very large country, which it is, with the very big resources, very deep pockets. And critically, the fact that if Pakistan has one friend in the world, or not Pakistan, Pakistan is too big a word to use, the Pakistani army, what is called in the GHQ, as they call it in Rahul Pindi, if they have one strategic ally in the world, it is China. So if the Chinese really want peace in their neighborhood, not just in Xinjiang, but even the success of the CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, then peace in Afghanistan should be important. Can the Chinese be persuaded to come along and work on the Pakistanis? To, so while the Americans work on the Taliban through the Pakistanis, I think the real leverage anybody has, it is China. 
can China be brought on board? And I think in that sense, this regional international community has a very, very important role to play. To me, as an Indian, I don't think so. India has very much of a role to play in terms of either proxies of influence and all is irrelevant. We had some bad experiences when Afghanistan was unstable. Terrorists operating out of Afghanistan were creating havoc in India, in Kashmir particularly and elsewhere. We had the hijacking of our plane. So for the Indians, we don't want an unstable Afghanistan. Beyond that, it's in our interest as India to have a stable, plural, democratic Afghanistan. But a government of the choice of the Afghans, Afghan-led, Afghan-owned, Afghan-controlled, whatever you want to say it, it's not for the Indians to decide who runs Afghanistan. It is for the Afghan people to decide. Having said that, what are the, what are the positive factors that can be leveraged to bring about, at least push towards the peace in Afghanistan? And I think they're the larger international community Operating World Bank it does have a role. In normal times, also these bodies have a largest oversized role to play in this part of the world. Particularly in the Corona world, in the where the world economy is shrinking, where countries are running out of options, you can use the World Bank and the IMF and others for the good reason of positive interference towards peace and towards pulling back countries' aggressive intents. I don't think so it's in anybody's interest that instability continues in Afghanistan. It's not, of course, it is not in the interest of the Afghan people, but it's not in the interest of the larger world also. We saw what happened years, 20 years ago, when you let in Afghanistan remain unstable. I do not think either the Afghan people or the neighbors or the world at large should accept that. So the title community definitely has a large role to play in nudging the actors, pushing them towards reducing the involvement, military involvement, or the, what should I say, West proxy involvement in Afghanistan. We need them to work towards peace. Unfortunately, organizations, regional organizations like SARC have no role to play. SEO would have a role to play only in sense of the China-Russia uh, angle. Can China, Russia, Iran is not a member. Can they work towards really moving towards a peace which is acceptable to the Afghan people? Because we need these countries together and the international community because even a post-settlement Afghanistan, I'm assuming that the peace talks go well, you have a new regime in place, whatever the composition, I'm not getting into that. That government would need the assistance of the neighbors and of the larger economic, uh, larger world community like the World Bank, IMF, the USA, European Union, etc. And therefore, combining these factors, I think there is a case to be made not in terms of, again, choosing proxies, choosing favorites, choosing these are my people and not my, these are not my people, but using these institutions, I think, to push towards peace would really make a difference. And therefore, the SEO would come in, the OIC would come in. OIC, in terms of the Muslim world, has a very large acceptance, and they can work with that. They may not have individual leverage, but I think in the larger composition of assistance and uh, political support at the UN and domestically, this would make a difference. End is, of course, the end game would be, frankly, it sounds very hackneyed, it sounds very stereotyped. Would Pakistan accept the Pakistani army, accept a stable, plural, democratic Afghanistan? Because if an Afghanistan is at peace and is stable and is plural, the view of the aim of the Pakistani army to control it in the name of strategic depth against India goes for a toss. And if that goes for a toss, I think we'll have a very large move towards sustainable peace in Afghanistan and not just peace in the short term. So once I'll conclude by saying, yes, the international community wisely, not by playing favorites, not by choosing sides, but pushing everybody. If you want to work with us and you need us, I think the time has come to end all these proxy wars and move towards peace in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zinha. That was uh, very insightful. Uh, let's move on to our last speaker, and then I'm sure there are so many questions that we can ask the panel members. So, Ambassador Su, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Abrizadeh. Uh, let me also thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, panel. 
which has uh, really very eminent people. And I think we've heard that in terms of the presentations that have been made so far. I think, uh, you know, I, um, there is a, I have a feeling that unless we identify what the problem is, we it is difficult for us to find a solution. And I have, I remember making this point in at a meeting in Kabul. Um, and at that time I had said that, why do we call it a peace deal? You know, the 29th February US Taliban agreement. Why do we call it a peace? Is it really a peace deal? I mean, the real name that we should use for it is a US withdrawal deal. Simple as that. And if we actually start using that label, I think many things start falling in place. But unfortunately, we continue to use it. And perhaps it is just ironical that it took place on 29th of February because we will wait for four years to see an anniversary. I don't know whether we will or we won't, put that apart. Um, so, because I think the key issue here is all of us have followed the ups and downs of the negotiations between the um, uh, US and the Taliban. Um, and I think that it is quite clear that from the four objectives, which we seem to have forgotten, you remember Ambassador Khalil Zad started out with four objectives. And one of them was US withdrawal. Another was the breaking of contacts between uh, Taliban and the terrorist groups. And then there were two other uh, objectives. There was a ceasefire and there was an intra-Afghan uh, reconciliation process. Now, you know, from the four objectives, we have seen that there is one which is front-end loaded, namely US withdrawal. We've seen that the U.S. withdrawal has already come down from 8,000 to 8,600. We've seen reports by General McKenzie saying that it will be down to 4,500 by November by the time the elections take place and so on. So that is front end loaded. Uh, there have been some assurances given by the Taliban about that they will not have any uh, contact with the terrorist groups like Islamic State and others. Uh, entities. But in the month of July, in the month of June, we have actually seen reports brought out by the Sanctions Committee of the UN Security Council. And we have seen reports brought out by the US government, SIGAD, the Special Inspector General on Afghanistan's uh, reconstruction. Both of them expressing reservations on this claim. And that the Taliban actually continue to have discussions and contact with very high levels within the Islamic State and other terrorist groups throughout this process. So clearly that is not happening as the US had wanted it. Uh, we've seen that the ceasefire is not there. Yes, the Taliban is refraining from attacking U.S. and coalition forces, but the Afghan security forces are bearing the brunt of it, as well as the Afghan civilians. The intra-Afghan dialogue has been started, but there is no there is no guarantor for it. And the U.S. has very um, has, has said that you know our responsibility is we are not in the room. It is for the Afghans uh, to work out. So there is no assurance, no guarantor, no. And that's, that's actually the reality. So what we are looking at is a U.S. withdrawal agreement that was signed on 29th of February. And therefore, it does not need any anniversary because it will be completed quite soon. Now, so then that brings us to the second question. And the second question is that uh, while it is true that 100% of the Afghans want peace in the sense that there is a 100% constituency for peace. Problem arises that uh, what are the terms on which they are willing to accept this peace? And I think this is where there are 
key fundamental differences. And we have seen some of these differences even in the preliminary uh, stages. I, I mean, it was apparent even in the 29th February agreement. What does the agreement say? The agreement, if you, I mean, if you remember, it says very clearly, it, it starts off, the title itself says, Agreement for Bringing Peace to Afghanistan between the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, which is not recognized by the U.S. as a state and is known as the Taliban and the United States of America. This phrase is repeated more than a dozen times uh, in the agreement. And I think that this, in a sense, just reflects the enormous gap um, that exists. And, you know, we have seen other variants of this. We've seen the debate even in the preliminary contact group meetings in Doha about uh, the jurisprudence, the Hanafi system, and so on. We've also seen a complete variation of opinions in terms of what exactly do the Taliban mean when they talk of power sharing and things like that. So I think that uh, while everybody, while all Afghans, 100% of them would like peace in their country, the fact remains that uh, the terms on which they are seeking peace is very, very different. I think um, I was glad to see uh, Ramatullah Nabil use the phrase that I have used, I think, earlier uh, on this in this forum, in your first session, where I use the phrase proxy peace. I said, we, in the context of Afghanistan, we have been used to the idea of proxy wars. You know, I think uh, Shoaib recalled the three phases, the Cold War, and then the subsequent, and then the subsequent, and all the rest of it. But I think now what we are seeing is the reality that just as proxy wars are complicated, proxy peace can be equally complicated. And I think that is the reality. And I think before we start talking about uh, uh, regional consensus, and I think there is a global consensus. The global consensus, if you look at it, is that they, they have, the global consensus is that they, by and large, the global community has lost interest. The US is interested in uh, an exit, and uh, you know, it reminds me there was a very there is a very telling phrase that Kissinger used in 1971 when he went on his secret mission to China to establish relationships, uh, relationship with China, and uh, the phrase he used was a decent interval. Um, in his meeting with Chao Lai, uh, he said, "The U.S. is now ready to leave Vietnam, provided." Our prisoners of war can be released and provided there is a decent interval between our departure and the fall of Saigon, the collapse of the regime in South Vietnam. And when Chao Lai asked him, and this is on record because the records were declassified in 2011, uh, and uh, when Chao Lai asked him as to what do you mean by a decent interval, he said, uh, well, anything 18 to 24 months. And that is exactly what happened. So Nixon visited in January of 1972, in end of 72, just before the re-election of Nixon, which he won very handsomely, incidentally. Uh, there was the peace, the Chinese, the North Vietnamese came on board and uh, Nixon campaigned on the idea that he was, a, he had a peace deal in Vietnam uh, to be concluded. In January of 73, the Paris Accords were signed between US, South Vietnam, North Vietnam, and the Viet Cong. And exactly two years later, and by, by you know, the Americans withdrew later that year when their prisoners of war were released. In 1975, March, April, Saigon fell. Kissinger got his Nobel Peace Prize for 1973. I mean, so the phrase decent interval uh, is comes to mind when we look at, so the, the US. Now, you look at Russia and other major powers, their interest is in terms of controlling the flow of narcotics. 
and in controlling extremism from their uh, soft underbelly, as Shakti pointed out. Major power China. China has an interest, yes, but then China can always lean to an extent on Pakistan to do whatever is necessary, particularly when it comes to its restive uh, Xinjiang province and the Uyghur community. And we have seen that in the past. And then you come to the regional power. So you see a major power consensus. I mean, European Union, to the extent that they have uh, you would call it as a major power or as a major actor. I think their interest is limited. As long as it doesn't come to their shores uh, and as long as uh, there is a certain peace and stability that is fine with them, they will continue to provide um, financial assistance and things like that. Um, that works. Then you come to the regional powers. So, and I think that the idea of finding a consensus has to begin from within Afghanistan. Only then can you find that there is going to be a regional consensus or a global consensus. I'm afraid it is not going to go down from top to bottom because that is not, as uh, again, as Shakti pointed out, currently the global order is going through an enormous churn. So we are not going to see on which issue, uh, Professor Akbarzadeh, I think we, this is a very informed audience, on which issue today do we see global consensus? We don't see it. I mean, there is a growing mistrust, if anything, on all major issues uh, facing the world today, starting from COVID to anything else that you may like to pick on. So I don't see a global consensus. I think the heavy lifting, in a sense, therefore, has to come from within Kabul. And the more, uh, the more there is a consensus on the terms of peace, in Kabul, in Afghanistan, I think the greater will be the ability to be able to drive also a regional consensus. A global consensus, I'm afraid, will take a little longer because right now, as I see it, there is a global um, fatigue, shall I say. The only global consensus today is to keep uh, to either exit or to keep the uh, issues pertaining to Afghanistan to the extent possible sealed within the borders of Afghanistan. And that is how I see it. So it is not, unfortunately, a very um, um, bright prospect. It all depends on what is the time frame that you are looking at. I mean, are we looking at, re-looking at this, let us say, two years from now? Or are we looking at re this say 10 years from now i think the perspectives could be very different and thank you very much once again thank you so much ambassador suit uh, wonderful to have your insights and as you have pointed out and other speakers have also indicated and explored this is an extremely complicated situation with so many moving parts um, in an ideal world, everybody agrees that peace is a good thing, but uh, what kind of peace are we getting and who's paying for it and which regional powers are benefiting or uh, missing out? So uh, to explore those many aspects, I'd like to open the floor to questions. If you could use the um, raising hand function of Zoom, people are often shy with the first question. So I might jump in with the first question myself. And I'd like to pose this question, I see RF has raised, so RF would be next. Uh, the, maybe I should save my question for last and since people are now eager to ask questions. So RF, go ahead and unmute. Okay, thank you, Shahram. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the wonderful speech. Uh, I've got two questions. My first question is at address to Mr. Nabil. Uh, how do you see the prospect of ongoing negotiation with the Taliban, given that the Taliban so far has taken quite an uncompromising stance on several issues? Chief among them is the Taliban has been consistently den denouncing the legitimacy of the current governance system and particularly the democratic values, principles that underpin the current system. Uh, the second question is uh, addressed to Ambassador Sood. 
Uh, when it comes to the AFPAC India tripartite relationship, there's a strong trust deficit uh, from the Pakistani side. Uh, most recently, Pakistani Prime Minister referred to India as ruling Afghanistan as a spider in the peace process. The question is what India can do to moderate such a perception uh, or trust deficit. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Ramatollah Nabil, if you'd like to comment, start. Thanks a lot. Uh, just briefly, I think to find the, the, the answer to your question, uh, if we put it this way, that what is the definition of peace from Taliban perspective? Right now, so far, it had seen that imposing their sort of emirates, whether they call it emirate or not, uh, but the same emirate which they have in the past, I think so far it has seemed like that. And we have not seen any changes on the ground. The violation has been not reduced. You know, the destruction of, of uh, infrastructure has been not reduced. Because of that, it's so far we cannot say that they have a very clear definition of which sort of peace they want in Afghanistan. It seems that they want to impose their, uh, you know, emirates. The only difference is that some of the Taliban behind the scene, they want to uh, take over the power by, by using military force, uh, their uh, military force. The Qatar group want to take the entire power in two phase, phases. First phase, negotiation, undermining Afghan constitution, the current achievement in Republic, and when they enter to that phase, then uh, they, they are thinking that uh, the next stage will be, uh, you know, uh, monopolizing the entire power under the, their uh, Islamic banner. Uh, so far, uh, we don't see any uh, positive, uh, you know, progress because we are stuck with the code of conduct. And how come? we will be able to convince them to, to come up uh, with the, uh, accepting the progress in all the gain which Afghan, particularly the new generation of Afghanistan has been made. We have not seen any, any changes so far. Uh, and also when I, I say the pre uh, proxy uh, peace is uh, meaning that they are insisting that whatever they have agreed with the uh, United States in Pakistan, on particularly the United States, uh, they should uh, impose that on the current uh, peace talk, which will uh, also add to the complicity of, of uh, inter-Afghan dialogue. Uh, and I think uh, Mr. Himi can add to that because he's uh, closely watching over there. But so far, uh, it, it's uh, not a good sign for, for, uh, from Taliban side. Thank you. Ambassador? Ambassador, so if you need to unmute. Yeah. Ambassador, yes. Go ahead. Um, you know, um, I think uh, in his early presentation, Nabil said, he made a point, I think he said that. Uh, he disagrees with the idea of uh, that Afghanistan is the site for an India-Pakistan proxy war because it appears to be more a justification for uh, Pakistan to continue its interference. Now, I mean, India has a certain vision for Afghanistan in terms of an independent, stable, uh, secure, autonomous Afghanistan where uh, inclusive, democratic, and you know, uh, trying to uh, recover or restore its connectivity role. And uh, I think we need to ask ourselves, uh, and whatever, we, incidentally, whatever we have done in Afghanistan, whether it is in terms of humanitarian assistance, in terms of infrastructure development, in terms of human resource development, um, is has been geared towards, in terms of institution building, has been geared towards these objectives. Uh, 
so I think that we need to ask ourselves as to uh, who shares these objectives. I mean, to the best of my knowledge, looking back at my time that I've spent in Afghanistan, I think that a vast majority of Afghans that I met, and I did travel around in Afghanistan quite a lot, uh, do share these objectives, a vast majority. Perhaps not all, but then it is for the Afghans to decide whether they want this, whether they share this vision or not. And if there are people within Afghanistan who don't share this vision, then it is for the Afghans to be able to um, reconcile this vision that I'm talking about with other Afghans. Secondly, I would like to also make one other fundamental point, and I have uh, made this uh, in a number of forums, including with Pakistanis friends, which is that, see, the India-Pakistan equation, unfortunately, is locked in hostility right from the birth of the two countries as independent nations in 1947. Frankly, if you ask me, much as I would like to see an improvement in that relationship, I think that it seems fairly unlikely at this moment in time, at least in the foreseeable future. If Pakistan is going to look at its relationship with Afghanistan through the prism of India-Pakistan, then I'm afraid that they will never be able to have a peaceful relationship with their Western neighbor because the hostility that India-Pakistan hostility that that will always color their relationship with Afghanistan. And given the fact that they have so many uh, shared attributes, you know, the after all, across the Durand line, the Pashtun communities and all the rest of it, the Baluch communities. I think it is, it is unfortunate if Pakistan is determined to bring the hostile prism of India-Pakistan, which, which has a whole different history, a whole different background, and therefore will require a whole different, uh, many other sessions that Professor Akbarzadi can organize. But, uh, but I think that if Pakistan is going to do that, then I'm afraid that it, it will always find it difficult to restore any sense of balance to its relationship with Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, we, all the hands are going up at the same time now. So <laughs> um, we have gone from famine to feast. Uh, our first question was posed by uh, Arif Sabah, who is doing uh, PhD research at Deakin University. Our next question uh, is going to be posed by Dr. Uh, Nishank Matwani, and I would like to invite everyone to, uh, to tell us where they are based, where they're coming from. So name your affiliation, please, when you ask your question. Go ahead, Nishank. Thank you very much, Professor Akbarzadeh, for this invitation, and thank you very much to all the speakers. My name is Nishank Batwani. I'm the Deputy Director of the Afghanistan Research and Evaluation Unit, which is a think tank, and I'm based out of Kabul. Uh, my question is related to, I would like to ask my first question to uh, Mr. Nabil and Mr. Rahim. Uh, the U.S.-Taliban agreement has had the effect of leg legitimizing the Taliban and undermining the Afghan government and significantly weakening its hand even before the talks uh, started in Doha. I personally don't see why the Taliban would compromise because they're gaining ground and the US-Taliban agreement is quite stacked against the Afghan government. So my question is, why is there an expectation that the Taliban would compromise? And secondly, what do you think are the Taliban's weaknesses, if any, that can be used against it in the negotiations? My question to Ambassador Sood and Mr. Sinha is that uh, India to date is one of the very few, if perhaps the only remaining actor that has not opened up direct talks with the Taliban. And by contrast, Russia and Iran have, and all three countries were backers of the Northern Alliance. The situation has changed considerably. So the question that comes to mind is, to what extent is India prepared to protect its strategic interests in Afghanistan? Thank you. Uh, 
Thanks a lot. Just uh, very <clears throat> briefly, I think that this was one of the very strategic mistake of Afghan government uh, that uh, they uh, somehow they got involved in internal uh, issues and then left everything to uh, you know to outsider in these two years and that give uh, a very strong legitimacy to Taliban. Three years back, Taliban were not in a position to claim that they take over for another completely but now uh, after uh, all this uh, you know legitimacy with uh, which they got and also the way they were uh, treated uh, for example the release of 5000 prisoners this was it was not a good decision um, and i think uh, that was a big mistake of afghan government now they are paying the cost of that their mistake in taliban or insisting that because they didn't left any leverage uh, for this peace talk Everything was already given up by, by Khalilzad to Taliban. Uh, and now they consider uh, uh, US uh, side as a, um, their main, uh, you know, uh, somehow uh, uh, that uh, they are insisting that they should go uh, after that uh, deal. And because of that, they don't consider Afghanistan as a serious, Afghan government as a serious player. Uh, regarding the weakness of Taliban uh, in, in the Afghan discussion or the, in Doha, I think they have a lot of weaknesses. The first one is uh, they don't know the new generation or new Afghanistan. And we should insist, what is their plan? Under the banner of Islamic. What sort of Islamic banner they want to use, the human rights, women rights, for example, access to education. Their, their plan should be more exposed to the Afghans. Oh, who is, uh, uh, who, we are going to talk, uh, who is going to, to be, uh, you know, uh, included and, and uh, power or uh, power sharing or whatever you call it but we should know because uh, this side we we know all the leaders their weaknesses their corruption there is a you know good uh, strong point and the weak point we should also expose uh, their uh, plan their weaknesses uh, through um, what plan they have for afghanistan i think um, this is important for the doha team to insist okay what are uh, your you know, initial plan for one, two, three, four, the, the key points? And, and the, this is the uh, time to, to, to be shared with Afghans, because when everything is uh, you know, concluded, at that stage, um, uh, we will not have a chance to uh, uh, you know, uh, challenge that, those uh, points. And because of that, I think uh, in addition to several other weaknesses, this is one of their uh, important uh, that we can uh, share with Afghan people. Shoaib Rahim, did you have something to add on that? Uh, yes, very briefly. Thank you very much for the question, Nishank. I think, I think it's a bit, it might be a bit uh, presumptuous to assume that it's a done deal already. Um, if the assumption is that the Taliban have, have nothing at stake. There is no leverage over them. Everything is agreed, agreed to already beforehand. Um, I think that might that that is, I think that's an assumption that does not hold true. Uh, in terms of in terms of how we are approaching this, how the Afghan government is approaching this, I think um, uh, it's very important to try and test and see um, the level of commitment to the political settlement of this conflict versus uh, the military route. Um, I think what I think the general focus due to um, the nature of, of, you know, and the openness of, of uh, Afghan society at large um, is to highlight the differences and the internal uh, rifts within the Republic and not paying enough attention to the, the, the very high level of fragmentation within the Taliban and the different schools of thought and different philosophies in terms of this peace process, as well as how to achieve the, the final goal of you know, um, um, 
achieve, being being a part of or or um, getting control of uh, Afghanistan. Um, I think recognizing the internal dynamics and fragmentation of the Taliban will allow will allow a more nuanced understanding of how these peace negotiations can create a create a space where those elements within the Taliban who are who are um, uh, more prone to and believe that a political route is is more realistic i think it, it will it will allow for more maneuvering space for them and so i think i'd like to think that i'd like to think that that's one way of that's one way of approaching it another very quick issue i'd like to mention is that um, uh, we, there are still a lot of Taliban prisoners um, uh, held by uh, uh, held by the Afghan government. Um, the release of five thousand it's it's five. The last figure I had was around twelve thousand. Uh, issues to be discussed, um, and you also have to recognize that uh, the conflict with the Taliban outdates NATO presence and US presence in Afghanistan. And so the automatic assumption that US withdrawal will result in Taliban control is also, I think, um, I think slightly unfair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other members of the panel have something to add or shall I go to the next question? Uh, there were questions relating to India also by Dr. Right. Matwani. Yes. Uh, I think it's just a very relevant point. India is still fixated on the old Taliban and we had bad experience because of the running of terrorist camp and the hijacking. I think in the new scenario, and President Karza's interview to an Indian newspaper three days ago was clear, Afghan, the Taliban are Afghans, you must engage the entire Afghan society. The Taliban themselves have made it clear, while well, there are no liberal internationalist, low liberal constitutionalist, fine. They have myself made it clear that they have refused Pakistan's attempt, say, to link Kashmir to the revolutionary Afghan process. So I think India should definitely open up. The world has opened up. Indonesia and Germany and France, not to forget Russia and Iran and China, have all opened up to meeting and hosting the Taliban. I think the time has come for India also to shed its baggage, its emotional baggage they have to shed. Absolutely. Okay, so the next question is by Professor Samina Yasmin. Thank you very much. Uh, really loved listening to all four of you. Uh, I'm just wondering why is it that we're not willing to link what's happening in Afghanistan with developments on Pakistan's eastern border? Because, you know, we may not want that, but the reality is that the perception that really moved Pakistan military in the 80s and the 90s to, I think, idiotically use Afghanistan as its part of its strategic debt. That was a reflection of the fear that India could use Afghanistan as a backdoor attack on Pakistan or undermining Pakistan. So with due respect, I think I would uh, question this idea that somehow Pakistan-Afghanistan uh, equation is different from India-Pakistan. My sort of suggestion is, and maybe I'd like your input on that, is that it is time for everyone in the region to change their way of looking at the situation. Uh, Pakistan-Afghanistan, they need to recalibrate their views of each other. In the same way, I think India and Pakistan need to do that too. And we also need to have a more nuanced understanding of the Pakistan military. Uh, Shab Rahim, I was glad that you're talking about the Taliban's differences. Pakistan military may have a very structured uh, sort of line of order, line of control within the organization itself. But the reality is that there are different views. And I don't think Taliban with whatever qualifications we have coming into the discussion would have done that had it not been for some groups within the Pakistan military that says the region needs to be viewed differently. So I guess my uh, concern is, and I'd like your uh, sort of some input into that, is that why is it that we are 
looking at a different situation. We want to change it for the better, but we're still in some way caught in the framework that has existed there from 1947 and definitely from 1980 onwards. I Anyone should add, can answer that? Thank you, uh, Samina. I should add that Professor Samina Yasmin is the Director of Center for Muslim States and Societies at uh, University of Western Australia. So the question is to the panel. Uh, anyone would like to engage with that? I see Shakti. <laughs> Go ahead. Happy to. As Rakesh was explaining, if Pakistan chooses to see Afghanistan through the Indian lens, what do I do to disabuse them? I really have nothing to say because as far as India is concerned, Pakistan is not a rival. Pakistan is not, is, is, an, is an irritant, but it's not a rival. So I really don't see how, if India was active in Afghanistan, if you could say, you can say the Taliban are based in Pakistan. You could say that the Haqqani network operates out of Pakistan. Can you find any network there which you can link with India? The answer is no. So if they want to destabilize Afghanistan and use India as an excuse, should India give something to them as a reward for that? I really don't think so. That would really satisfy them because their aim is very different. A liberal, plural, democratic Afghanistan is a threat to the Pakistani army's dominance of that country. That is the key. India is a sideshow. India is an excuse. And on the Eastern Front of Pakistan, nothing is happening. Routine things keep happening. They keep sending infiltrators. We keep trying to stop them. That's all. We don't send infiltrators. So, you know, there's very little that you can do unless you want to fall into their trap and give them what they want without their having to earn. For, earn. Okay. Uh, Mr. Nabil, go ahead. Just, uh, um, you know, I have, uh, you know, I can uh, share so many facts that uh, I will go quickly through some of them. Uh, I heard several times from uh, our Pakistani friends that there are 40 consulate of India in Afghanistan. Uh, this is just to, to prepare or justify their interference um, in Afghanistan. There is only four consulate of Pakistan, India, Iran, as a neighbors in different port, number one. Number two, sometimes they are claiming that uh, TTP is supported in Afghanistan. I can prove that TTP was created under Baitullah Masood uh, while his uh, father-in-law was uh, working in establishment, exactly to bring uh, several uh, terrorist uh, uh, you know, elements under that banner and to fight in Afghanistan. Number three, sometimes they are claiming that uh, there is a Baluch Federation movement is uh, uh, receiving support from Afghanistan. Uh, if we go back to the recent years after the martyr of uh, Akbar Bukti, uh, even prior to that, they approach Afghan government if, if they can help, but Afghan government say no. And there is no single uh, proof presented by Pakistani that Afghans are, are doing this. Number four, India is providing, uh, you know, 1,500 or more um, scholarship to Afghan, young Afghan students. What is uh, that? will affect, uh, affect Pakistan uh, relation to Afghanistan. Uh, India was build, building a, you know, a power dam, Bandi Salmo. There is nothing to call it a proxy between India and, and Pakistan. That There was a build of a highway Nimroz Dilara and thousands of Afghans were killed. There is nothing uh, to be connected that with, with uh, Pakistan, while uh, Pakistan or, and also the building for parliament, which was, uh, uh, you know, with the help of uh, India, was, there is nothing to do with, uh, uh, you know, all those uh, perspectives. 
the the, the Afghan uh, need to uh, you know invest in their agriculture in Pakistan, uh, India created uh, established a university in Herat for uh, in Kandahar. There is nothing to do with with uh, Pakistan. Uh, and there are so many other, uh, you know, I can, I can uh, mention that. The Zarba Azba operation, I was at that time a uh, part of a delegation. When they conducted this operation, we went to Pakistan and we asked uh, Sartoj Aziz as a national that, that if you just three names of mid-level uh, Haqqani commanders who have been arrested or killed during the Azba operation. We will accept that this operation was, uh, you know, as a help for Afghanistan. Never it ha happened. Because of that, you know, definitely we should change. Uh, you know, the, we should open a new uh, page. Uh, we should consider the, the change in situation. We should consider change in Afghanistan. Uh, by calling it, uh, you know, sometimes uh, they call it proxy between India and Pakistan. That, that first, we are not, in this case, we are not, uh, we are, we are uh, you know, considering uh, the victims of terrorism and the supporter of terrorism at the same page. Number two, the security forces of Afghanistan, which are uh, protecting their, their uh, sovereignty, their constitution, they have been considered as, uh, as allies or proxies of India. This is not a good, uh, you know, definition, which uh, sometimes our Pakistani friends give it to their own public, uh, by, uh, particularly by, by uh, the military uh, and, and uh, uh, ISI. If we are believing that there is change, and there is change in Afghanistan, and there is, a, you know, desire for peace, uh, and it should be more regional peace, not just, uh, you know, uh, monopolizing peace. Uh, that's our main worry because the Soviet Union came by their own, but they left the war to Afghans. And then the region also paid a cost. We are worried that if the same mistake is being, uh, you know, repeated, that uh, US and uh, NATO forces came after 9-11. And now if they leave Afghanistan without uh, you know, leaving a good legacy behind, Afghanistan in the region will pay the cost once again. This is, uh, let's focus on that. Uh, if we go back and forth, yes, there was, uh, we can, we can uh, talk about it. Uh, the, of, since uh, nine, 1990, we see the involvement of uh, Pakistan in Afghanistan. We see that the Orpishing for their strategic depth. We see that uh, they are, uh, you know, uh, want, they want to impose their, uh, uh, you know, favorite government in Afghanistan through which they can control several things. I think that will be repeat of the mistakes uh, of the past. Uh, and now if we uh, see things differently, then we, the approach should be uh, differently and we should come up with a new perspective instead of building up on these old um, you know, way of thinking. Thank you, Mr. Nabil. We'll have a quick comment from Samina and then we have the next question. Thank you very much. Are you going to mute? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad you uh, said, Mr. Nabil, what I was getting at. I think we do need a different frame of mind now in terms of separating Pakistan and Afghanistan and then Pakistan and India. The peace does require a regional approach in which India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and others will have to change their outlook. Otherwise, we'll stay caught in the history and not go forward. That's about it. Thank you, Samina. The last question has to be by uh, Abbas Farasu. I'm sorry, we can't, we don't have time for more questions. Abbas, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Abbas Farasu, a PhD candidate at Deakin University in Australia. Just a quick question to Mr. Shah Ibrahim. Uh, Abdullah Abdullah went to Pakistan, given what Mr. Nabil said, what's changed in Pakistan? What do you expect to have from Pakistan? Pakistan support, says that they support peace and free India's peace is pilot. So what is new, what's changed? What is your expectation to have from Pakistan in this process to help the Afghan government in the peace process? Thank you. 
Thank you very much for that question. Before I get to it, I'd just like to refer very briefly to the issue of the release of the 5,000 prisoners um, and the approach of the government. We have to separate and distinguish between having an ideal process in our hands and doing what it takes to lock in the Taliban in the talks. I think we also have to recognize that um, we have to play with the cards we're dealt. In terms of the release of the prisoners, the reason why a, the, the Grand National Assembly in Eloya Jirga was called was very much to consult with the population, to consult and allow the state to move forward with this, because there is a recognition that it might be a higher price to pay than initially expected. And so I think it's, it's important to recognize and frame the commitment of the Afghan government to use this historic opportunity, and it is historic by all measures, to try and find an alternative to the end of this conflict, an alternative to the military option. So I just wanted to, to, to reframe and highlight that as uh, was previously mentioned by Mr. Nabil. Getting to the, the issue of Pakistan, thank you for, uh, thank you for the question. I think, I think looking at it from a regional context, the fact that we have come so far demonstrates, demonstrates the, the extent that this redefinition is taking place. Now, everyone has concerns about the extent of Pakistan's support to this process. There is, that's, that's pretty much um, almost, we can almost say it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an unanimity that the, the, the key role that Pakistan plays in ensuring that um, the Taliban uh, remain on board um, has to be continuously uh, focused. In terms of the signaling and messaging, I think that uh, over the past year or so, we are seeing uh, the Pakistani establishment uh, prov provide the, the, the right signals and uh, the right type of messaging. But whether or not, whether or not this translates into ground realities, whether or not the issues of um, uh, cross-border attacks, issues of safe havens, issues of financial resources, issues of recruitment, whether or not we realistically see a shift um, in, in the position and in the role played by neighbors on these issues is yet to be seen. Um, um, I, but I think the silver lining is, and, and what, everyone's, what everyone's hoping for, is that the, the peace process and the peace talks will mature and, and reach a stage where it becomes a realistic alternative for the regional actors to try and invest in this process with the end state of having, having a, a political settlement with the relevant stakeholders involved. And so... So that is something that is under work and under progress, and we are continuously engaging Pakistan and other regional actors to ensure that this process gets momentum. Thank you. Well, with that positive note, I'd like to bring this session to a close. We are just one minute uh, uh, beyond the time limit. So, oh, Ambassador Sud has well, something very I, quick to say. Please go well, ahead. I, I just wanted to, I've been trying to get your attention, Professor. Oh, sorry. Abdul, but no, <laughs> that's okay. Go ahead. I just wanted to say that I think it is important for us to understand that if we, uh, if we kind of look at um, Pakistan's eastern border and things like that, as Professor Yasmin was suggesting, then in a sense, we take agency away from Afghanistan. It's almost as if we are forcing Afghanistan and Afghans into being a pawn in a power game. And I think the real answer for peace in Afghanistan is to give agency to Afghanistan, to strengthen Afghan institutions, to strengthen Afghan capabilities in that regard. And I think that uh, should be the focus because then the Afghans themselves can deal with their own diversity and their own uh, issues on their own with a sense of confidence and and then the international community can play a supportive role. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh
everyone on the panel really enjoyed your insightful and contribution. Uh, I'll invite everyone on this Zoom meeting to unmute and give a big applause to the panel. <laughs> Virtual clap. <laughs> Thank you so much. As uh, you will know, the, uh, this was this is part of a uh, project on proxy wars that uh, we are conducting at Deakin University, sponsored by Carnegie Corporation New York. There are two more policy dialogues to be held. The next one is going to be on the 15th of October, and it will look at the conflict in Syria and uh, how the proxy actors and proxy factor impacts the conflict in Syria. So if you have not seen notification, feel free to visit our website and uh, see the list of speakers. Once again, thank you all for joining us. Have a good day, have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Great work. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you for joining us. Okay. Bye, Safi. Sorry, Bye. I didn't get. I didn't give you. Oh, no, 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 no. Give you a chance. All good. So no, many no, questions no. coming up at the same time. <laughs> I can imagine. Next Thank time. you. That, that was great. That was great. All right, Safi. All the best. Thanks.